is giving birth now. You will drop fresh ripe dates in your lap. Therefore rejoice, eat and drink. And should you meet any mortal, say to him, I have vowed to fast and merciful and will not speak with any man today. And she took the child to her people. So we see here uh, another bridge point, this uh, virgin birth idea. And then, um, then we uh, see a statement. We're going, well, let's get the, uh, this is interesting. Though. She made a sign to them, the people visit her, pointing to the child. And they replied, how can we speak with a babe in the cradle? It reminds us of uh, maybe the shepherd's visit and the king's visit. How, how can we speak with a babe in the cradle? Whereupon, the baby spoke and said, I am the servant of Allah. He has given me the gospel and ordained me a prophet. His blessing is upon me wherever I go, and he has commanded me to be steadfast in prayer, and to give alms to the poor as long as I shall live. He has exhorted me to honor my mother, and has cursed me of vanity and wickedness. I was blessed on the day I was born, and blessed shall I be on the day of my death. And may peace be upon that day when I shall be raised to life. Familiar echo here. But you see, it says, the son of Mary. This is the whole truth which we are unwilling to accept, which they are unwilling to accept. Allah forbid that he himself should beget a son. And he decreed the thing he would only say, be and it is. So in the last line, we begin to get uh, part of the argumentation between Islam and Christianity. This is a polemic against the idea that Jesus is the Son of God, or is begotten by God. Well, it goes on, and it goes on to account the story of Abraham and so on. Well, I thought I would just uh, go through this to give uh, people uh, just some feel for this holy book of Islam, and some of, perhaps, if people are not familiar with the Quran, some uh, uh, indications of the kind of things that are of special interest to us in this uh, holy book. That's all by way of just ca capturing the mood for, uh, for, for this uh, discussion of the relationship between Christianity and Islam. I want to um, sort of put this in the context. And the question is, why is this whole discussion important? Well, it becomes crucially important since we got so many Muslims in the world, about a billion of them, and uh, perhaps a like number of Christians in the world. And we live in a world uh, where the uh, Cold War, as we said, has ended, and where the Soviet Union is uh, not the threat that we once perceived it to be. And with the Persian Gulf crisis and continuing problems there, many people see the future, the sort of geopolitical situation as being one of conflict between the Christian West and the Muslim East. And so uh, when we even uh, think of some of the uh, notions, uh, we think of our hostages that uh, were held in the land, we think of the, uh, in our news reports, we see reports that Shiite groups hold hostages in Lebanon and so on. All of that that mixes in uh, religion and politics, and we begin to see how important all of that is in the, in the future of the world, in the large picture of what's going on in this world of that. It's interesting, even when uh, Columbus was portrayed over the uh, thing of Columbus was coming, I don't know if people saw it on television, but uh, uh, in the very first program, they made a big thing out of saying, well, the, one of the reasons Columbus came here is because he was looking for spices and gold in China, in uh, what we call the Far East, East Asia, but he couldn't get there. He couldn't get there safely because the Muslims held so much of the territory. Because Islam held so much territory, therefore, to the uh, Christian uh, West, you know, couldn't exactly figure out how they're going to mine this riches of the East, and so they end up uh, looking to go the other way around. So even Islam is extremely important in uh, the whole relationship of the, 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 uh, the encounter of the two civilizations at the time of Columbus. It continues to be extremely important. 
historically and every other way. Now, the context that we Christians uh, command this is, uh, is, first of all, great antipathy and great ignorance about Islam. In fact, you could say until the 19th and 20th centuries, the Christian world was either uh, almost totally ignorant of Islam or held, I mean, tremendously poor and outlandish stereotypes of Muslim people. It's really only in the 19th and 20th centuries that uh, the, the Christian West began to get accurate translations of the Quran. Uh, or uh, have some sense of the scholarship uh, and background, some sense of the Islamic culture and so on. Uh, Goethe uh, was one who introduced uh, a more enlightened understanding of Muhammad and Islam. But that kind of only gradually, and in the 20th century, of course, we began to, to see uh, that in a more favorable light. And in the Catholic community, by the 1960s, we arrived at a very surprising kind of statement, very open statement about the great values of Islam. So we find in the Gentium number 16, uh, a statement of, of our relationship with the Muslims, uh, with Islam, these people who profess the faith of Abraham, that we share together, and together with us, adore the one God, monotheism, same God, variously called Yahweh, or Allah, or Abba, same God, the merciful one, and the God who will judge everyone on the last day. So we have, in the Catholic community, moved from a position where Islam was seen as nothing but a pagan religion, where Islamic culture was looked down upon, where Muhammad was seen as nothing but a false pretender, to a very positive understanding of Islam as a vehicle of truth and salvation, and uh, by uh, a uh, sort of corollary uh, of positive assessment of the Prophet Muhammad. So, but still, while that is sort of the enlightened view that uh, the Catholic uh, community took in the Second Vatican Council, we still see a lot of unenlightened positions on the question of Islam and Muhammad among Christian people. So even within the Catholic community, there's people who have not yet caught up with the official teaching of the church. So, that little sort of uh, context study for all of this. Now, what I want to do is uh, look a bit at uh, Muhammad from two different angles, and then look at Jesus from two different angles. And then, um, I don't know if some of my Muslim friends are going to be able to stay, uh, but if they are, when after the lecture we have uh, time for questions and comments, I'm going to give them the first opportunity to do that, and uh, so that uh, they can sort of prepare themselves for that. First opportunity to make a brief comment or to ask a question. So, we we'll start out with um, the question of uh, the Christian perspective on Muhammad, first of all. Now, uh, Muhammad, uh, we recognize the date something like 570 to 632 in, in that area, after Christ, or the prophet after the time of Christ. We have someone growing up in the uh, Arabian Peninsula. Um, we have someone who um, in his, uh, lost his uh, father before he was actually born, uh, was raised as an orphan, and therefore seemed to have a certain feel for those who were in difficulty or distressed in one way or another. Uh, we find uh, Muhammad then uh, in his younger years marrying a rich wid widow, and um, being uh, extremely faithful to this woman. Uh, we find then that Muhammad was a man who uh, liked his solitude and his prayer. You must remember that he lived in a polytheistic environment, and uh, one in which uh, women especially were not uh, very well treated, and uh, where the uh, people who were in charge of commerce and business seemed to be the power forces. 
Well, Muhammad uh, had a very spiritual side to him, and it is said how he went out into the cave outside of Mecca, and uh, there he would pray to God. And uh, during the time of his prayers, he began to have these visions. And these visions he attributed, as time went on, to the angel Gabriel, who revealed to him see the, uh, the message of uh, the great God Allah. Well, uh, Muhammad uh, the, uh, the, uh, spoke out these uh, visions as he heard them, as followers uh, or other people would uh, record them. This is the kind of the material then that became uh, the substance of the Holy Book of the Quran. Well, uh, the people, of course, as soon as any of the prophets arise and have uh, trouble uh, with uh, others, uh, the uh, other people don't like them, the establishment people have problems with all this, especially those in power, and the same thing happened uh, to Muhammad as it's happened to other prophets, so he ran into a lot of difficulty. Um, he was, uh, his uh, wife died in 619, I'm looking at some of my own notes here, it was in 620 that Muhammad uh, reputedly had the famous night journey from Mecca to Jerusalem. And I want to uh, just uh, read, this is uh, crucial in my mind uh, in terms of his whole call, uh, the night journey as it's called, and uh, just a, a sense of this. Um, <coughs> Glory be to him uh, who made his servant go by night from the sacred temple, which is Mecca now, to the farther temple, which we interpret as Jerusalem, whose surroundings we have blessed. So it is as though in his vision and his encounter with God that Muhammad is transported, something we recognize from other prophets and mystical type experiences. Goes on to say, we gave Moses the scriptures and made them a guide for the Israelites. And when the prophecy of your first transgression came to be fulfilled, we sent against you a formidable army. And we said, I'm skipping parts here, if you do good, it shall be to your own advantage. We sent another army, evidently the Romans, to afflict you and to enter the temple as the former entered it before, utterly destroying all that they laid their hands on. So we see, remember, here's the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem. And then um, he says, Here is your book, read it. Your own soul shall this day call you to account. And then we get some of the fundamental message that comes out in this vision. Sir, no other gods besides Allah. Thus you incur disgrace and ruin. Your Lord has enjoined you to worship none but Him, and to show kindness to your parents. If either or both of them attain old age in your dwelling, show them no sign of impatience, nor rebuke them, to speak to them kind words, treat them with humility and tenderness, and say, Lord, be merciful to them. They nursed me when I was an infant. And in here we see some of the fundamental commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not kill any person who Allah has forbidden you to kill, except for a just cause. These injunctions are but a part of the wisdom with which your Lord has inspired you. Well, uh, we go on with the long night journey chapter, but I see it as fundamental to the religious experience of Muhammad. Well, as I said, he runs into um, trouble, and then we have in 622 the famous flight or migration of Muhammad, his followers to Medina. <coughs> so he has trouble there. He left there, goes to Medina. There he builds up sort of power and influence. And then it was a couple years before his death that he came back to Mecca, sort of completing this uh, whole thing. And so that this message he, he gave seemed to have a tremendous appeal and, and vast numbers of people came on board and accepted Islam which fundamentally meant to surrender to Allah. And as we know in the century after, it was spread amazingly around the world until we got to that point, you know, where, uh, um, where well, at the time of Columbus, where such a vast amount of territory was held by the people of Muslims. 
So we get a lot of history there as well as all of that, but uh, the great spread of the Islam is quite remarkable. So when we read that or hear about that, you know, the question is, how are we Christians to interpret that? Now, what uh, evaluation do we, do, we, do we put upon all of that? Well, it seems as though we can really applaud the great uh, thing that Muhammad did in bringing monotheism to the Arabic people. So we had there a polytheistic society before, and he, uh, he brings that all together and under this uh, great allegiance and surrender to Allah. So bringing monotheism is a great contribution. I mean, his tremendous political uh, abilities to unify the whole Arabian Peninsula. What uh, we would applaud, what he in, in his whole idea of raising the ethical standards, as we know, one of the things he stood for was alms giving, alms giving to be given to those who were less well off. In many ways, he raised the status of women within his own society. He reminded people that there would be a judgment so that he taught uh, his people that they were accountable and responsible and had to act to take good choices so that they would be rewarded finally in uh, the final judgment. So, I mean, we would make positive evaluation of all of this, it seems to me. Then, we go beyond that, it seems to me we can, in the Christian world, and this is absolutely crucial to the future dialogue, and um, is crucial to the uh, Islamic uh, perception of where we Christian people are. Because, as Dr. Kenneth Bragg pointed out in a lecture recently, the problem with Islam has often been this. We honor Jesus. We see him as a marvelous prophet. Well, we see him as a messenger of God with a wonderful message and we honor him and we honor his mother tremendously. Probably more so than many Christians do. And so the question comes back to us, well, if we will honor Jesus like that, why can't you accord some status to Muhammad, our prophet? And that's always been a sticky point within Christian theology up until our own century, when uh, through advances in theology, and as I say, recognized in the Second Vatican Council, able to see the prophets in a very different light. My own teacher, Carl Wanner, says the way we should define a prophet, and this is not the way Islam would do it, but the way uh, out of a Christian, you know, a prophet is one who correctly interprets the divine human relationship, who understands important things about how we relate to the great God. And so what we find here is our ability as Christian people to say, yes, we would see Muhammad as a prophet, as one who saw vitally important things about our relationship to God, that there's one God, and that we are to submit to that God, that we are to surrender to God as his will and his primary, that we see important ethical implications. And so when we read about Muhammad or look at the Quran, we are able to say, yes, a prophet speaks here. And our whole theology of grace allows us to do that. And so our, and when, uh, when I'm talking about the visions of Muhammad and his deep religious experience, I have no problem in saying that out of my, the, the theology of grace that I would hold, a grace that touches the heart of all human beings, an inner word that echoes in the consciousness of every human being who's ever existed, some people are able to discern that and articulate that in a, a powerful and insightful way. And so that one doesn't have to say anything strange about human existence out of my theological framework. I, all one has to say is that Muhammad is one who is in touch with this great situation who felt and knew the power of the Spirit within him and was able to respond to that and to articulate that in important ways. So that would become my theological basis for being able to say, yes, we can and should affirm Muhammad as a genuine prophet who based his work on a special relationship with God. I'm drawing here a lot on uh, the work of Hans Kuhn in uh, the book that I mentioned in uh, the Reflections article. 
to me have here a genuine prophet, one who was totally committed to his vocation, saw his calling from God and gave himself over to it, who stood up against the establishment powers like we would expect any great uh, prophet rooted in the spirit to do, took on the business interest, the commercial interest. Here was one uh, who functioned as God's messenger, who had an important truth or truth to convey. He was one who understood the need to submit to the merciful judge. And, very importantly, he was one who didn't just proclaim his word, but also tried to live out in action and deed, and insisted that the faith in the one God had to issue in uh, action, in a life of uh, commitment and so on. I think in this regard, it's uh, helpful to see, at least from my perspective, how Islam functions within the Muslim consciousness. And what one begins to see in this regard is a tremendous um, lesson to us Christians because the Muslims have a great integrated sense of how all of their belief in God affects every aspect of their lives. There really is no distinction in Islam between a sacred and a secular realm. There's really no uh, sharp distinctions like that between a life of faith and a life lived in the world. What they have succeeded in doing is overcoming those dichotomies which have so often plagued us in the Christian world to our detriment. And they have found a way to put all of that together into some sort of integrated picture. Uh, so Islam is, is powerful in this way. It, it is uh, insightful. And when we, when we look at all of that, we see uh, uh, you know, a corrective to the kind of things that we face the problems that we experience uh, ourselves. A whole way of life. In other words, our, our Muslim friends cannot often understand the kind of distinctions that we make when we try to discuss with them. They can't understand the distinction between church and state, for example. That sort of thing makes little sense to them. Just as the distinction between uh, what would happen in worship and what would happen in everyday existence. So there is uh, this uh, blending together that is a powerful kind of mix. Now, we also, and then trying to say all that I can affirm about uh, Muhammad out of the Christian context, so it's open up dialogue with our Muslim friends, we can affirm the religion that he started. Well, we can affirm um, the power, the universal appeal of Islam. I mean, it's not accidental that there's uh, one billion followers of Islam that it's uh, probably the fastest growing religion in the world today. And what we can see about their five fundamental truths, it seems to me, is the way that these, um, these pillars, as they call them, their ethical duties as, as uh, Muslims, uh, is a way of suffusing their religion into the whole of their, their time and space, so that their time is made holy, by praying five times a day. Time is made holy. It's also, you know, there's a rhythm to the Islamic way of life in which constantly the belief system is integrated into all aspects of life. So in the same way that the five makes the, 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 um, the day holy, the five times, uh, their, their worship, their Friday prayer uh, word, uh, service, worship, uh, the right word there, but um, uh, their Friday prayer together sanctifies the week, and then their holy month of Ramadan sanctifies the whole year. So their month of fasting. So you can see how it's designed to sanctify time. But it's also designed to sanctify space. It also works geographically because they are to pray facing Mecca, uh, the holy place for them, or... Uh, Muhammad began his spirit of prophet and then returned to Medina. And then also the pilgrimage to Mecca, once in one's lifetime. Uh, again, uh, a geographical kind of note that, that sanctifies the state 
and this earth in which we move. So the five pillars, you know, are, are we can affirm those as uh, extremely important in achieving what many of us think is an ideal religiously, that is, an integration uh, of the faith in many ways. Next point I think we can say is that we can see in Mohammed, much as the good Muslims do, a role model. A model of a person who tries to put into practice uh, and live out the virtues that, that he preached to others. Then I think we can uh, say something uh, positive about the Quran also, the Holy Book. I believe out of the Christian framework, just as we can say about the Bhagavad Gita, or uh, Hindus and the Lotus Sutra or the Buddhists, that this is a sacred scripture. That this is, as I'm uh, quoting somebody, I forget who, and I use this in a recent dialogue that people picked up on, that the Quran is, is a book that is both inspired and inspiring. So that we can say both things about that. We can say the Quran is inspired and inspiring. So there are important messages in there about how we ought to look for vital text, the life and action is a vehicle, we can say this. And again, in the Catholic community, we can say this out of official understanding, that the Quran is a vehicle of God's revelation. Uh, it is uh, a way that God has proclaimed message to us. And finally, it seems important for us to affirm the beauty and the power of the Islamic culture that is stopped upon by the religion. Uh, there's one uh, way in which that's been extremely important to us, and that is that the thought of Aristotle in the Middle Ages was kept alive within the Islamic world when it was not known in the Western Latin world. And so the Thomas Aquinas, got his knowledge of Aristotle through the Arabic philosophers, something that Christians often are not aware of. So it's through those people that there's a great synthesis, but it's a common touchstone to Christian people, especially in our Catholic world, this marvelous synthesis, Summa Theologica, we find the Beroese and Avicenna uh, quoted in there. And we know it's through them that Aquinas had access to Aristotle's thought, and was able to produce this magnificent synthesis of Christian faith and Greek philosophy. So just one example of something we can affirm within uh, this, uh, this uh, world of uh, Islam. Now, what we need to do from there, let me just stop there and see if we have any questions about um, Mohammed uh, up to this point of uh, well, what I think is a positive response on the part of the Christian community. Next thing is to try to say what Islam says about Mohammed uh, beyond what we Christians are ready to accept. I believe it uh, has a universal significance and um, it, is, uh, it is therefore possible for Christians to pick up the Quran and to read it as uh, a source of inspiration, as uh, helping us understand the truth of the divine human relationship. So I see, I see it as a vehicle of revelation that is accessible to all people, because it basically functions that way for Muslims, but it can function that way for anybody in the world, and also for us Christians. So, Important thing that, you know, I mean, there is uh, something sort of to be said about that from our Christian perspective, but, uh, you know, I want to start out by that sort of positive assessment. And we have something more that we out of our Christian perspective need to say about that. And that much, maybe we need to say that now. I mean, it's to complete the picture, you know, but it, and of course this is reversed for the Muslims, but for us, uh, the New Testament remains judgment upon them. In other words, while I, we want to affirm out of this contemporary theological viewpoint that uh, the Quran is an authentic vehicle of revelation, we have we claim, our, we, our Christian claim is, that the fuller revelation is found in the New Testament. And as such, it remains judgment upon, for us, upon all the other sacred literature, including the Quran. 
So that if we are to look at this, that this would just naturally happen, even apart from the theological framework, if you sat down and read it, there's some things in here you would say, oh, that's good, I never saw it that way before. Yes, that would help me live, that's great. And what would you be doing? You would be doing that as a Christian person because it accords with the gospel or you can hear echoes of the gospel in it as you read it. There's other things in there that maybe you would balk at. And you would say, well, I can't buy into that. And again, why would you say that? You would end up saying it because your perception is, your mindset is shaped by Jesus of Nazareth, the gospel is kind of the judge that you use to look at other sacred literature. So that would complete the picture. I might say, Muslim person would say the same thing. They can read our New Testament and say some good things in it, some things I don't like in it, but uh, what they're doing effectively is making a judgment upon it based on their on the Quran. So every religious tradition does that. That's not to say anything unusual, but that's just exactly what we do. And the theory is, for us, the fullness of revelation is found in Jesus of Nazareth. And I'm getting ahead of myself here because of the way in which Jesus of Nazareth for us functions like the Quran does for the Muslims. And there's a nuance there that we have to get into. Yes. Where would Muhammad have gotten his story about exactly the resurrection of the Lord? Well, uh, uh, of course, we're going to get uh, different uh, viewpoints uh, on this question, aren't we? I mean, uh, the, uh, the Muslim and the Islamic community is going to say he got them from the angel Gabriel, who revealed them to Muhammad from, uh, you know, Allah. Now, we, who have passed through the Enlightenment in the Western world, and as, we, as we're going to see in all the dialogues we've had with Muslims, the same thing appears. And we in the Western world are products of the Enlightenment. And to be a part of the enlightenment means we question, and we have doubts, and we're critical, and we want to know historical perspective, and we want to go back and ask the very kind of question you ask. Now, when Christian scholars do that, their sense is that there was a Jewish Christian community in Arabia. And that Muhammad either had direct contact with them, and that's a much disputed point among Christian scholars, or knew of them. And that really explains a whole lot. Because the, uh, the group that we call the Ebionites, which is a heretical group within Christianity, which was largely Jewish type Christians, we take them as a model, much of what they held would sound very familiar to what's in the Quran. In other words, they had little sense of the pre-existence of, of the word, pre-existence that you get in John's Gospel. They did have a strong sense of the virgin birth and the role of Mary. There would be a lot of reasons to think that uh, I would say this, apart from being able to make a direct link, and as far as I know, the scholars are not able to do that. But there is a circumstantial sort of proof that when you look at the text and you look at the material, there's an awful lot of similarities between Jewish Christian outlook and especially that they're represented in the synopsis and what we find in the Quran. Or was the Quran is much closer to Matthew, Mark, and Luke than it is to John. Very different. Very different uh, sort of thing. Uh, in fact, that's one of the things that dialogue with Islam will look a lot different if the Christians concentrate on the synoptic than if they concentrate on the gospel of God. Also, I mean, uh, we become much closer together by, by looking at uh, some of the texts uh, in the New Testament that, for example, in the great charismatic term in Acts where Jesus was told Jesus through his death and resurrection became the Messiah, the King God, the King of Son of God for us. All those texts like that, which represent an earlier period. So the theory is that Jewish Christians migrated to uh, Arabia there to have had some influence on Muhammad. Again, our Muslim friends usually reject any kind of analysis like that, because they don't need it, because you don't have to ask that question because Muhammad got it from Gabriel. So who needs a Jewish Christian to 
And that's what defies us so often in the debates that go on. I can see this is about four hours to figure out. I mean, it's fascinating uh, material for me. But let me just uh, go on and say that the further thing that Islam wants to say about Muhammad, of course, is not that he is chronologically the last prophet, but that he is the final and complete messenger of God. So Islam wants to insist that the prophets, they want to define prophet differently than I uh, define prophet. The prophet is the messenger, the spokesperson for God. The prophet delivers a message. And the one who, Jesus, had a particular message to the Israelites, and he delivered it. But it had a particularity about it that was incomplete. And then Jesus really <laughs> prophesied the coming of Muhammad. And especially now we do turn to, this, our Islamic friends now do turn to John's Gospel, because in John's Gospel it talks about the paraclete, the advocate who will come. And the advocate will do all kinds of things, convict the world of sin, and speak the truth. Oh, that advocate will come and make clear all the things that Jesus didn't clarify. Boy, I mean, it makes a marvelous picture, doesn't it? And what the Islamic community says of that advocate that Jesus proclaimed that would come, and Jesus said that, was exactly the prophet Muhammad. And so the Muhammad becomes the final messenger, the advocate, uh, the teller of the truth, the complete truth, the universal truth that... Uh, as a matter of fact, Jesus didn't possess because of his own particular situation, the fact that he was the messenger to Israel. And once you transpose prophet to messenger, and then you see the relationship of Muhammad not as chronologically the final prophet, as we might be willing to say, or chronologically the later prophet than Jesus, but as a definitive prophet, a full prophet. And therefore, but Mohammed and Muhammad, you understand it within Islam, Muhammad is a man, a human being. There's no pretense that he is the son of God or a divine person, nothing like that. Muhammad is a messenger. And what's really important is the text, especially the Arabic text, not this English translation, but the Arabic text that he has delivered to us verbatim, exactly as God has dictated it to him through the angel Gabriel. So it, he Muhammad points away from himself so that the Quran is really the word of God. We begin to see the difference. See, for us Christians, the word of God is not the Bible, first of all, we say that, but we know that that's a secondary statement. For us, the word of God is Jesus. And the Bible witnesses to Jesus not that way, but Muhammad is a conduit. Muhammad produces the text, and it's the text that is the guide for life, the rule, the law, the uh, warning signals that are allowed to shape us up and to keep us on target. So the claim of, uh, of the ground is much greater than the Christian world wants to be able to affirm. You know, where it's a simple matter in one sense, because Islam, Muhammad is the final definitive messenger of God to the Christian people. Jesus is the fullness of the truth, the very word of God himself. It's interesting in the Quran, I think it even describes Jesus as the word of God. You know, and, uh, oh, I'm going to get to Jesus next, so I don't want to carry it away with that part. But the first part is to see the whole thing in the context of, uh, you know, how we look at the Prophet Muhammad. Now, that has ramifications in all the areas. That means that with Islam, we are both monotheists, along with our Jewish friends, the three great monotheistic religions, one God, variously called Yahweh, Allah, and Allah. But one God. This one God is the creator of the world. One God is the judge. They're both all of the three, not of the religion, all. So he's 
see a great similarity here, a constant in, in our whole efforts to, to put all this together. We see the sacred scriptures as important. We believe that this God relates to us as, uh, as the, the creator, that this God uh, is merciful to us and forgives us, is compassionate to us. Now, at the same time, we see differences in this God. Now, in the Islamic world, the great problem is that this God is seen as Trinitarian. And when Islam hears that, when they say, there's these Christians walk around saying there's three persons in one God, they accuse us of tritheism. They say that we believe in three gods. And that's hurtful to them, because they say you're supposed to stand with monotheism as one God. And Trinitarian doctrine undercuts that. And so that becomes a rub. That's why in the Korean passage I read to you there, they're so against saying, you all get around and saying Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. They're not big on calling God Father, because God doesn't have sons. Okay, doesn't, uh, it isn't, isn't the begotten the Son, as uh, we would end up saying within the, the Christian tradition. So Trinitarian doctrine is one really that um, divides us in many ways. Of course, to make a response to that. And this is, again, this shows how we can learn. A crucial point so you can see the dialogue really is a challenge of Christians. But what Islam reminds us is, is that we Christians are not tritheists. We're monotheists. We believe in one God. That's primary to our faith. One God. That one God we feel, and now we have to find a way to talk so that our Muslim friends will not misunderstand us. And we can't just walk around saying, well, there's three persons in one God, because they...